long day, I got a lot to say. It feels like I'm carrying a two-ton weight. I go to see a friend. Hello, I'm Monsignor Patrick Winslow. And I am Father Matthew Cowth. And we are speaking from the rooftop. A podcast brought to you by Tan Books, in which we invite you to join our conversation out here in the open air. Where we look out upon the world around us from the rooftop of the church and share with you what we see. Makes me You know what I was thinking about? Do tell. Well, you know, uh, we're ramping up to a midterm election. And everyone gets pretty edgy, given the state of our political climate. Uh, And uh, we certainly are not primarily interested uh, as one who uh, proclaims the gospel and represents a church of being perceived as political in our orientation or in our first purposes. Um, But we're oftentimes caught as priests because we have to address certain topics and issues, and they then get translated by the faithful, rightly speaking, into policy and how it sorts out in a given political system, uh, depending on which country you're in. So things get a little heated because oftentimes people want you as a priest to uh, voice their... Yes, their particular policy issue and they want you to be the one using the pulpit because everyone gets politically charged and we're trying to drag people to the polls and they want certain outcomes and it gets really kind of crazy and everyone gets very nervy. So in the past, I've always thought to myself, we should talk about the role of politics Hmm. in the life of the faithful outside of a political climate. You know, outside of a political season where everyone's gearing up to the ballot box. Now, I feel like we're still far away from the November midterm elections. That, that we can touch this that thing That we can without. kind of touch the topic <laughs> and, and not, not be accused of anything. Um, um, of trying to sway anyone's particular votes or their practical wisdom with respect to social policy. But I, I'm going to um, kind of offer you one thing, one scenario or one situation that happened with me mm. in this last presidential cycle. And I'll share it with you and share it with the people who are listening uh, just to kind of give you a sense of some of the problems I think we were faced with mm. uh, as believers. I, I would say that just to, for, for the listening audience there, um, I don't really watch any politics. And all of my politics is filtered through Father Winslow. Yeah, it's kind of been that He way is my long. go-to. So he distills <laughs> it all for me and gives it to me in a very... 30, quick 30 second sound bite what do I need to know I do my so, best but how, how well have I done he does a great job absolutely right? because you can always measure it against how things unfold absolutely right so there is a way to check no, it there's, I, I wouldn't say there's prophecy involved but no. there's there's some sound um, sound prudential uh, uh, outcomes that have he's predicted or or I've accurately characterized the moment yeah there you go uh, All right, you know, so that's kind of what I I'm a believer do. I'm a believer now so, I, I handle politics and level of the theory so I'm happy to <laughs> talk about that after all right so um, it was prior to the last presidential election again everyone who's lived in the country uh, knows how tense that year of COVID was and the political season so people were very queued up on all sorts of issues Uh, especially the life issues uh, and uh, other related matters. And I was covering at a parish summit because, you know, I don't have a regular congregation because I'm not assigned to a parish in my current role. Um, And I decided that I wanted to speak to people about uh, an appropriate way to deal with the political realm within our Christian souls and caution them on perceiving the political landscape as the only landscape for Christian victory. Um, In fact, caution them altogether uh, in having a sort of worldly view of the kingdom of God, that this has to play out here. 
and that the Christian mission is succeeding or failing based upon the degree and the extent that the political realm right, is right, reflecting right, it. Right. And the degree and the extent in which the right people are getting elected to advance the right policies that are in accord with the gospel. Um, you know, we I, I think I mentioned a little bit about in the time of Christ and the zealotry movement and how there were there were a number of movements in uh, the, the the Jews at the time that were looking for uh, what you might call a political messiah, but certainly one who would reunify the kingdom relative to a temporal kingdom, uh, not merely or, or rather not really or specifically looking for the eternal kingdom, but they were thinking in terms of temporal. Uh, of course they would, right? I mean that's. That's the kingdom. That's right. what You're it was. King, I mean, it was, David mean. was the king. I mean, it was a temporal kingdom, and so there was a concern for a Messiah to come and to to reunify and bring the kingdom back together. And it can get to a point of thinking that everything ultimately is about success and failure within the political or geopolitical sphere. And I was trying to caution people about right. that. In which case, we'd all be very depressed. Well, yes. We'd keep losing. Well, <laughs> and I didn't know what the political. Out- I didn't know what the election outcome would be, one way or the other. Um, and there were certainly a lot of uh, people who were pro- pro-life motivated in this particular congregation, congregation, rightfully so. And as I stood at the door of the church, I had a number of people thank me because I, 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 uh, my sense was that they wanted some guidance and perspective. They were not looking specifically for someone to tell them how to vote or what to do or to take on what issue and prioritize any given issue. They just wanted some perspective, and I think I was able to deliver. But a woman who was clearly a woman uh, who was sincere and zealous, she told me that I made all of the saints and Jesus and Mary cry. Oh. And I was... um, I didn't know you had that kind of capacity. I didn't know that I had that sort of influence. You never even made me cry. So. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, what, 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 are you, what are you talking? I, I, I was so dumbfounded. Um, her point was that I should have been, you know, stumping for certain political um, uh, candidates. And whether they be on the state level or a national level uh, or whether it was the national level, i.e. the president, that I was supposed to advance certain individual people and that I probably gave them some reason not to be as animated as they should be and that I clearly was part of the problem in the American political culture because I wasn't animating to the degree and the extent that I should have or could have Mm -hmm. these people to go out and get other people to vote for a certain outcome. And I... I thought to myself, she she totally missed my point. I mean, she's also proving it, right? In the sense that you see your religion as being successful or unsuccessful within the geopolitical theater. Right, right. Uh, what about the kingdom of right. God? Right. Jesus didn't see it that way. He was very clear about that. Yeah. All right, I've said enough. It's well, I'm you. sorry that my mom said that to you. Well, <laughs> I didn't want to say it, but <laughs> boy, oh boy, sometimes she just misses the mark, Cal. I don't know how you do it. Well, I mean, this is it, and I have had so many, so many um, occasions in many years of priesthood to um, realize that that persons oftentimes invert the order of things, such that they're not concerned particularly about the kingdom of God that is of the soul, or the kingdom of God that is um, the common good of the church. Um, but rather the political party can use the church, um, which is the primary religion in some sense, the political party, um, to advance various doctrines, um, such that when we have an occasion in which the seated president, as we have now, is a Catholic but may not um, align with any of the principles of the faith or something to someone's uh, satisfaction, etc., they would want to abandon um, not just the candidate, but also sometimes the church, because the church hasn't done something to make sure that to he's aligning, to, uh, to, to compel them to align with what have you. Now, that is a case in which, of course, we have inverted the entire system, that, that there is only one king and all authority is by necessity borrowed. But what's interesting to me about politics, more on a, a theoretical level, that of course gets very practical fast is that I was always fascinated by the medieval insistence of its nobility because we don't 
have that anymore. We don't have respect for politics. If you say politics, you assume that old proverb that's the last refuge of the scoundrel, right? You, you assume that it's the entire thing is massively corrupt from top to bottom. We talk about it as a swamp in the last presidency, right? And I'm not saying that it's not. Um, but the medievals held such an, an indefatigable love for those in politics, not because they were good, they certainly weren't, and they had no delusions about that, but because of the, the noble activity itself. In other words, someone who is concerned not just with his private good, but someone who's concerned with the private, the, the common good, is something that's closer to the divine activity, because the Lord is always concerned with the common good, which isn't contrary to someone's individual good. It's just not private. Right. And so... One of the things that anyone realizes the moment they begin to take any sort of position of leadership is how incredibly hard it is because you can no longer think about your private good. I think I might have mentioned it in a different episode or maybe we were just talking. I can't recall because mm-hmm. it's just episodes are just sometimes we actually hit the record button. Right, exactly. <laughs> we're having the conversation anyway. We don't recall. Um, we try to capture them for everybody. Yeah, but Every Father, now and then we have our own you private said, conversations. You said uh, not long ago when we were watching one of the seminarians um, skateboard down the road mm-hmm. with a frisbee in his hand going off to play frisbee and you said to me do you remember days in which the only good we had to be concerned about was our own yeah and it struck me because it 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 gets to the heart of what is the common good right a common good isn't something principle that's divisible it's a good that diffuses its goodness to the many and you can actually only have a common good by having it shared but you can't divide it. It's a whole. It's what St. Thomas calls a, a virtual whole or a, the kind of a whole of order. Mm. But someone has to do the ordering mm-hmm. for everyone to enjoy it. So, you know, someone's school is, in, is, is a common good. The seminary is a common good. The diocesan family is a, is a common good that we all share in and we get to participate in it, but it's not divided. Whereas like a pizza or something like right. that, right? Your piece is your piece, not my piece. Even when we say we share a pizza. Right. Um, so for the medievals, it was so clear that the most noble thing you could do was to be like God, was to order things for the common good. So getting back to this position of uh, contention that we sometimes have relative to having to be in positions of leadership, how hard it is when someone comes up to us and asks a question. Because they're just thinking about their private good. Mm -hmm. And it might be a good for them, but you have to take into account every single ramification. You much more than I do. I run a seminary. You help to run a diocese. And so every particular request that you get, especially if someone's asking you as you're walking down the hallway, Mm -hmm. is hard because you think, how does this affect the whole? And for that reason, someone who's a a policymaker or, or, or in politics, one who governs the city. Yeah. I mean, it's a huge responsibility. Mm-hmm. And one that certainly is is not something we should be shying away from, but something we should be jumping into. If you're doing it right, yeah. it should be hard. Yeah. Uh, if, it, if it's only about navigating your own success, then the whole thing is self-centered. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you are truly having as your object and goal uh, the common good... Which is, of course, um, which of course comports to objective reality in our mm-hmm. case, sound reason and right, divine revelation. Right, right. Uh, then it's really hard, yeah. And it is a, a type of service, and it certainly tracks to the type of service that our Lord had described about um, about being the last, you know, about being the one who is a servant of all. Yeah, uh, that it really should feel that way, and if you're doing it properly. Because you're thinking That's about true. literally everyone else That's right. and not yourself. And I, I found myself in situations, and uh, now we're talking about ecclesiastical governance, where I'm just looking for somebody who's willing to set their own consideration aside. Sorry. When I, I, and I, I find myself, because I'm in the position of having to guide, to, uh, to, to guide or to lead, that I'm very quick to say, I'll set aside mine, my own desired outcome. Uh, yeah. Because I feel... The weight of trying to get at the right answer or the best answer for the common good, and it becomes challenging yes. because often people 
approach everything as an adversarial system that if you don't advocate for your cause then there will no no one will be advocating for your cause and therefore your cause will be run right over run mm-hmm. roughshod mm-hmm. where it's not supposed to be that way in a servant leadership role it's really meant uh, to be that the, the one who's in the servant leadership role is supposed to be looking out uh, for those who have strong advocacy and those who have no advocacy those who have no advocacy uh, and yet oftentimes people in the life of the church they don't assume that. Yeah. Uh, they don't assume the best. And there may be reasons and historical reasons and bad examples that have been set in the past where there hasn't been an appropriate uh, amount of vigilance with respect to all people and all the individuals, including um, those who have no advocates. But it certainly shouldn't be the norm. And we ought to be able to kind of reset the presumption. Now, getting back to the civil political side, you know, um, I think that most people want to know, first and foremost, how this fits into a Christian life. Mm-hmm. You know, how does the whole geopolitical um, dynamic of our life here um, in this world play or factor into our own personal lives? And on the one hand, I think it's important to say, I think it's right to say that it's important. And I think the church speaks to that and models that. But on the other hand, it is not the ultimate importance um, that our religious faith is is not being successfully lived only when we have certain ge- geopolitical outcomes. Right, right. Uh, that is not the case. In fact, we can look to these moments in the life of the church where um, you see extraordinary beautiful things happen, whether it's St. Francis rising up in the life of the church, or whether it's Ignatius Loyola, or uh, St. Dominic, uh, that at the time, you know, they were having no impact on political society. Right. But the most amazing and beautiful things were occurring that would ultimately be such a power and force in the shaping of society. Right, right. Yeah, one could even... But it wasn't born in the political realm. right. Um, even looking even more recently, of course, with Pope John Paul II, right? mm-hmm. St. John Paul, incredible amounts of influence that he wielded by virtue of, of the word and the faith that eventually assisted in, of course, in the toppling of communism in, in Poland. You know, I think that one of the ways in which Catholics c- could consider themselves um, parts of a whole, we have to remember that that we don't mean that in terms of being used by the whole in some sort of totalitarian system. No, a, a person is a substantial whole, but we want to be part of something. I mean, everyone wants to be part of something, but now it's the difficult thing to do because everyone's so hypersensitive to their individual good. Um, and you see this play out when we actually go to vote. I mean, what are the issues upon which people typically vote? When you ask them, you know, it. Are you thinking about the common good when you vote, or are you thinking the thing that best um, benefits you? Mm. You know, whether it's drug prescription prices or this, that, or the other. That aren't high-level things. They're important for your pocketbook and things of that nature. But what's the best outcome for not just me, but the guy who lives down the street? And that takes a, a fair amount of, as you say, laying aside some wishes you might have, because we're so concerned all the time with our private goods. And making sure that I get, I have to get as much of those as I can. Mm-hmm. Like there's only so many jelly beans in the jelly in the, in the jar, mm-hmm. and I'm going to vote in such a way that I get the most jelly beans. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a stupid example, right. but that's treating everything as a private good, and everyone's scraping to get as much as they can, as Their opposed portion. to thinking about okay. the movement of the of the of the body as a whole. And then, as you said, kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. Our Lord was very clear about how these things would happen in the course of history. And one of the first instances of a, of a major event that happened where you realize that, wait a minute, the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of the church um, do not ever really coincide in the same way at the same time. Mm-hmm. You have, sometimes you have a very happy marriage for, right. for a short period of time, but ultimately you have this, this St. Augustine dealing with this problem in, in the city of God, right? Mm-hmm. Um, because Rome was gone. And no one believed that could happen. 
Right. It was such a seemed like such a perfect marriage. How could this not work? Mm-hmm. Right. Now we have the, the, the ripe time after the Pax Romana, and here comes here comes salvation, and now we have a means of distributing it to the ends of the known world, and all of a sudden it falls. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think as a as a practical matter for people kind of sorting this stuff out and as they approach a November election or election in two years, an election four years from now, and then six years from now, and so on and so forth. Um, I think I would say, put it in perspective, mm-hmm. uh, that our faith informs us, yeah. uh, forms our mind, uh, is in concert with uh, sound reason and right thinking, and that the way in which the church sees it is that the clergy of the church form and shape the faithful with respect to matters of faith and morals. Um, and it is really the purview of the lay faithful and the people who are um, living their Christian lives by assuming certain roles in society, but also being active agents in society, that they're meant to be the ones who sort through the real considerations of practical wisdom and um, uh, uh, and various functions to creatively put forward policy uh, laws in accord with right thinking, sound reason, but also instructed by the truths of our faith, certainly never contrary to them, and that in that realm, they're supposed to do some hard work. Right. Right. Uh, I think oftentimes what happens is people want the priests and the clergy of the church, bishops, to connect all the dots for them. Or if they come up with a plan that they think works, they want all of the clergy, the bishops, to support those programs and endorse. And that's where we're kind of caught because uh, we're not interested in the first and foremost and a, and, and a certain political outcome, uh, we do have a general interest with respect to the common good, and we need to shape uh, the minds and um, uh, the souls of the faithful such that they can rise to assume that responsibility in a right way in accord with their Christian faith. Yes. Um, and, and so oftentimes we can be accused of not going far enough, uh, but we all know that it does sound kind of strange. It hits our ears and our souls wrong when a priest goes too far. Right. Uh, it just, right, it's right, like, eh, right, this is right. not what the pulpit's for. Um, you're supposed to allow for the faithful to be able to appropriate and assume their responsibility. To the degree and the extent in which you have a very well-formed uh, group of faithful in a the parish, then they're going to do great things in society. Right, right. They're, they're going to be the light and the leaven. Yes. Um, and they're going to be amped up, and they're going to do, you know, fulfill their roles not just in the parish, but in in the larger uh, geopolitical world, uh, world um, and landscape. And they'll, they'll do wonderful things. But you can't really shortcut it. You you can't go from, all right, well, the bishops and or the priests of the church sort it all out and give marching orders to clear, to to the faithful, and they go out and do it. It's not really meant to be that way. We're not really supposed to do it that way. It's not, certainly not how the church sees it. Um, i got to be honest, uh, I also find it uh, really disheartening to see our political climate and culture so toxic. And what I mean by that is, um, you know, uh, for years, I noticed when I was first ordained that I would get a flurry of phone calls from people who want to talk about uh, problems in their families, and they typically followed Christmas and Easter. Right. And I, because you end up talking about politics. Yes. Well, people are getting together that time of year yep. where they normally don't. And then when they do, they're engaging in uh, politics and religion, tends to be another one, and things get tense and dicey. Well, you know, my advice then, a preemptive set of advice, you've right, heard me say right. before. This is the hum. This is the... Post closing prayer speech after before, yeah, thanks, Thanksgiving. before Thanksgiving. Exactly. Yes, it was Thanksgiving, not Easter. It wasn't Easter. We've always so much. done that. It was pre Thanksgiving and pre Christmas. Those were the two. You're going to be with family. So listen up. You haven't up. seen them in a while. They believe lots of different things in you, uh, politically and religiously. At least have one day where you can enjoy each other, set all those things aside. Uh, if something comes up naturally, providentially, of course. But uh, otherwise, don't take the bait. 
You can have some crazy uncle try to, you know, bait you and troll you, or you can have some, you know, young whippersnapper coming up from college with all these ideas, and they're going to try to bait and troll you. Um, just don't take it. Just say, please, no, thank you, but just pass the potatoes and move on, right? <laughs> like, just move on. Don't take the bait. Have a fun day. Enjoy each other. Because there's a reason uh, uh, why you get together. Presumably, you want to be together. Why would you, you know, inject uh, things that are going to create uh, attention and conflict? Take that time to enjoy, right? So then I discovered in the past few years that there are actually political groups who send out talking points for Thanksgiving and Christmas. Are you kidding? No. They, they are attempting to radicalize wow. family members to go and uh, to have these talking points ready for these co- these As conversations. As if we don't have sufficient amounts of polarization. <laughs> it's like, well, exactly. These are the times of year you should actually set aside some of these differences, come together and really just appreciate one another. And to think about how healthy our political culture could be would become if we could do that on occasion. But we're at a point now where it's almost not allowed. You know, where if you're on a different if you're on a different political side of something, you are considered to be enemies. Right. And that is toxic. It is just toxic. Yeah. I mean, this is the problem with identity politics, right? You're no longer you're not and this is part, it's interesting and ironic, right? That we have a, a society that doesn't want to be considered a part of a whole. And yet we're desperately joining a party, a party, right? right? We're desperately joining something about which we can be a part um, and identify such with it without even, even necessarily knowing the policy that it has. Um, and I think that one way to diffuse the situation, it whether it's Thanksgiving or any other event, um, is to to back just back up, back up, back away from the party, back away from the uh, the argument as it as it rages uh, in the in the political sphere, and begin to talk about purposes. Like what what is it that you think is good for the human person? Yeah. What do you think is good for the human person? Why? Um, how do you think we should organize this and why? Um, and m- get people again to think about how we're going to organize ourselves for flourishing. I mean, it does take some of the bite out of it. And I find it it, it sort of re- releases the tension and the pressure. But more than anything, you're actually just for a second listening to someone else's story, right? Be- which everyone loves, right? Everyone wants on some level to be listened to. And why do you hold what you hold? I, and I know this only because as a priest, and I'm sure you experience this too, I do have some members in my family that will want me to police every other member in my family mm-hmm. and make sure that they're on board with everything. And 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 I, I feel that when I walk into the room, like they're mm-hmm. waiting for me to do it because that's mm-hmm. my job to make sure that everyone's on the same on the same page. And I typically don't take that route yeah. on the contrary, which is, I'm, a, I'm a choleric. I don't mind taking that route, um, but I don't find it effective at all. No, it's not. And in fact, you have it easy because my father is usually lining up a list wherever we travel, say it's on a cruise ship, of all the people that he thinks I need to talk to. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, no, I cannot possibly. I mean, there were one time we were sat, we were sat with all these various people, you know, because the way the dining worked and we were on a cruise. And, you know, he was certainly lining up all the conversations that oh. needed to happen. And you your know, dance card was full. <laughs> oh, oh boy! No, I get it. So actually, you know, I was thinking about it. It's kind of ironic that our American society has an, has has come to have a great distaste for proselytizing, for religious proselytizing. However, it has wholeheartedly embraced political proselytizing. Absolutely. Uh, it's the it's a religion. It's but it's the same thing. It's just a different arena. But political proselytizing is is somehow um, not only considered permissible, but actively engaged and embraced. Oh, and when you don't hold the creeds you're supposed to hold, yeah. <laughs> I mean, ultimately, you are. There is an inquisition that takes place. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's 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 a different type of proselytizing, and so you know, I, I'd like to think that. We don't proselytize, rather we evangelize, and we do so according uh, to the manner in which our Lord instructs us through the gospel is, 
in the ways in which we ought and inspired by the Holy Spirit. And the idea of proselytizing, of getting in people's face, I think um, we kind of be able to set, that's been set aside and, and rightfully so. But the political sphere, they saw that tool and ran with it. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah. and that's one which, you know, again, we're talking about our American context. You know, that's, that's happening. Yeah, that's true. Well, before we go, I have to say that I am wildly interested in making proper focaccio as of yesterday. You have to explain to people what that is. Yeah, so focaccio. What are those is, words? Yeah, it's just, it's an Italian thing. The Italians also have a thing called cecina, which I love, which is basically just pizza dough with um, olive oil, flaky salt, and rosemary. Cooked on a stone? Cooked on a stone, right? Same thing you can make in as a focaccio with slightly different dough. Um, but there's, we were just talking earlier, and what made me think about this is that we think that our Lord chose bread for his, the most sublime thing that we have on this earth, of course, his own body and blood, because a, a carb is really the most sublime thing. It really made, is. That is edible. It's, I love carbohydrates. And, I mean, they were my favorite thing. And I was thinking about that relative to focaccio, because a proper focaccio is so chewy and wonderful and good. Mm. So I, I found a recipe, the sisters found a recipe that uh, you don't have to have a starter, and it's probably not quite as good, but man, it's easy and it's fantastic. So that's kind of what I'm thinking about right now. That's fantastic. Right, sorry, so you brought up the food thing. So, all right, my latest uh, food thing is homemade lemonade. Really? So, yeah, so, you know, you can buy bags of lemons pretty cheaply. But years ago, my brother, uh, Rich, he got me um, one of those squeezers, yeah, like the freestanding right, squeezers. So it's juicer. really easy. A juicer, that's it. It's amazing how few lemons are needed to make a pitcher of lemonade. That That's pretty con- that's pretty uh, strong, uh, just lemon, straight up lemon juice. But then, you know, you add... You don't have to add sugar if you add sugar if you want, but I, you know, I, I like to add uh, equally or, you know, some one of these uh, sugar substitutes. And it's delicious. I mean, it really is. It's just nice. A good very, summertime very nice. drink. Yeah, you're not getting lots of chemicals from mixing, you know, from mm. prefab stuff you buy in the store, and it's 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 fresh. It's delicious. Um, did you ever le- have le- lemonade stand as a kid? You know, I don't think I did. Really, I probably thought in my head that I should. But I don't think I ever executed. We never really had a uh, like a neighborhood where you'd have people passerbys. I did. Right. We just didn't have that. Like sort of the sidewalk. Mm, people. I was by. big on the lemonade stand. Did it work? Yeah, not to my not to my satisfaction though. Which is the reason to this day that ever, if ever I see a lemonade stand, which is fairly rare, but if I do. I always stop and get some from kids, and I always give them way too much money. It's probably horrible for them. Oh, right? Like I'm ruining it's, their, it's like their sense thing. of what actual labor yeah. and, and, and economic uh, justice is. <laughs> You're encouraging panhandling. I really You're the am. very reason why people stand at the corners at these uh, red lights and oh, come at you because heavens. you started it. I did. Uh, I did. It's my fault. Evoke sympathy and hold out really? a can. Well, uh, hopefully when you had your lemon, lemonade stands, you, you declared your income. And pay taxes on it. Great to see you all. I talk to you. <laughs> Have a great week, and uh, we'll talk to you guys soon. All right, ciao. God bless. Makes me wanna scream from the rooftop to the screen. Thanks for listening to this episode of From the Rooftop. For updates about new episodes, special guests and exclusive deals for From the Rooftop listeners, sign up at rooftoppodcast.com. And remember, for more great ways to deepen your faith, check out all the spiritual resources available at tanbooks.com. And we'll see you again next time. From the Rooftop. Rooftop.